Jazz 101 is recorded at WEAA 88.9 FM, Oregon State University. Welcome to another edition of Jazz 101. Tonight, it's all about the clarinet. Our special guest tonight is Seth Heibel. Seth is one of the mid-Atlantic premier woodwind specialists working with some of the best bands in jazz, swing, and more. Wowing audiences on saxophone, clarinet, and the flute. Winner of 28 Washington Area Music Awards, they're called Whammies, including the Best World Music Instrumentalist. His most recent recording is called No Words, Instrumental Jazz and Klezmer by Seth Keibel. Uh, tonight we will be talking to Seth about the clarinet and the era where the clarinet ruled the charts. Welcome, Seth, to Jazz 101. How are you? Oh, thanks for having me, Tom. I appreciate it. You, you brought in some artists for us to talk mm-hmm. about, and I know that we have... Sidney Bechet lined up first. Could you tell us a little about him and why he's such a guy? Well, Sidney Bechet is really the uh, the grandfather of the entire jazz clarinet tradition. You know, uh, let me backtrack. Quick story. So uh, I, you know, played clarinet in school bands and whatnot growing up. And around the time I was in eighth grade or so, I started to get interested in jazz. So I went to my middle school band director, a very well-meaning uh, individual, and I told him, I said, hey, I'm interested in doing some jazz. And he said, that's great, but if you're going to play jazz, you're going to have to learn the saxophone because you can't play jazz on the clarinet. Now, of course, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I'm kind of glad he said that because it forced me to learn the saxophone, which is an important part of my musical arsenal. Uh, but of course, that's a completely ridiculous statement. I agree. Because once upon a time, Uh, The clarinet was one of the primary voices in jazz. When you talk about uh, New Orleans trad jazz in the early decades of the 20th century, when you talk about jazz in Chicago in the 1920s, when you talk about the swing era in New York in the 30s and 40s, the clarinet is right there front and center. And yes, it all begins with Sidney Bechet, the great Creole clarinetist from New Orleans. Uh, my knowledge about Sidney Bechet is Van Morrison screaming about him all through his, his you know, I'm a Van Morrison yeah, fan, and sure. then he, says, he keeps on saying, talks to him about Sidney Bechet, and so I had to listen to him to find out what was going on. Yeah. He's more on the lines of a early pioneer of jazz, period. Would yes, I say he that? Is. Yes, and and his, his stuff is still considered technical or innovative and creative at this time. Yeah, well, actually, the recording I've picked uh, for you to listen to is really a fascinating recording. In fact, if we were talking about the history of recording technology, uh, we'd talk about this recording. It's a recording from 1941, April 18, 1941. Now, I mention the date because this recording is, to the best of our knowledge, the very first use of overdubbing or multi-track. Oh, okay. Prior to this recording, everyone had to be playing live in the same room. This is a recording of the old standard, Sheik of Araby, but it's credited to Sidney Bechet's one-man band. <laughs> piece that, that that was like the time period that a clarinet was like the lead because it lost favor through the years. It so. did. It did. Now l- let me just point out that what you just heard was not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, but six Sidney Bechets. He was playing every instrument. He was playing clarinet, soprano saxophone, tenor saxophone, uh, piano, double bass, and drums. Wow. He's it's the, just a, a the first incredible prince. talent. Yeah, yeah exactly. First <laughs> prince. I like that. Yeah, how yeah. about that? You know, uh, his life ended short, right? You know, uh, he was, what, I think fi- in his 50s when he passed away, so longer than others. I mean, he, and he's actually one of the few sort of happy endings in jazz uh, because 
he lived long enough to capitalize on the Dixieland revival of the 40s and 50s. Uh, Eddie Condon put him on in concerts at Town Hall in Manhattan. He ended up spending the last, last 10 years of his life in uh, Europe, mostly in France, where he died a wealthy celebrity uh, in a chateau in France. Um, you know, us jazz historians, we hate it when people live to a ripe old age and die happy and wealthy. Yeah, we much prefer the jazz tragedy. He's not a good example of that. No, no, that's a, that's a total success. So I would say he would be, you know, the, the first person out there that, that, was, uh, that, that set a trend. Would you say that the clarinet died out because the trumpet took over, or would you say that the saxophone took over in popular music? You know, it's more, more the saxophone. Uh, in the late 30s, 40s, the saxophone definitely transforms from being more of a novelty instrument into one of the primary voices of American jazz uh, through the popularity and success of people like Coleman Hawkins with his huge hit, Body and Soul, in 1939. An incredible recording, uh, but certainly a tragic recording for clarinetists, yeah. in that the clarinet starts to become a little bit more of a passe sound. And when you get to the bebop era, uh, the clarinet definitely fell out of favor. Now you have a few who, who, who play it during the bebop era, people like Buddy DeFranco and Tony Scott and others, uh, but there's no question that clarinet never really becomes a primary voice in this music uh, after the swing era. Yeah, I also have a thought of um, masculine feminine. And uh, not that to say that... that I, I see where you're yeah, going. Yeah, that the, the clarinet would seem to have a more sweeter sound mm -hmm. and is not as... As sexy, you can't swing that thing around in the band. As, well, as I you, like to. As you can, well, <laughs> as you can in, in, with a saxophone or whatever, to really kind of you know draw attention to yourself. But yeah. so I mean, I look at it as um, as time passed, it becomes like a, just a sweeter sound than more of a sexual overtone with a sax or with a trumpet. And this is just kind of a theory of mine. Yeah, that's an interesting interesting thought. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it coming back because. It, there's something about, to me, a clarinet and uh, that you that really stands out in a lead. Uh, we have I, what I consider the master coming up next. Would you say that? Uh, yeah. Oh, if we're talking about Benny Goodman, definitely. And you know, you can draw a direct line uh, from Sidney Bechet to Benny Goodman. Indeed, uh, Sidney Bechet spent much of the 1920s in Chicago. And Benny, as a teenager, was part of a group that uh, jazz historians call the Austin High Gang, because most of them went to the same high school. And they'd bribe the doorman at these clubs to let them stand in the back and listen to people like Sidney Bechet, King Oliver, uh, his young protege, Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, play night after night after night in these clubs in the south side of Chicago. And there's no question that Sidney Bechet is a huge, probably the single greatest influence on the sound of Benny Goodman. And it's not uh, hard to hear when you listen to Benny Goodman. I think that people don't realize that Benny Goodman is huge. Like, during mm -hmm. that time period, he would be considered you know, Drake. Oh, uh, he, yeah. he was, at the age of 26, he was the biggest star in the country. I mean, he's the one who really... He, he wasn't the first to play the style of big band jazz, not by a long shot, and his sound was basically a, a copy of the Fletcher Henderson model down to the very arrangements the musicians were playing from. Nonetheless, his big band is the first to top the pop charts. He's the guy who transforms jazz and swing from a niche musical genre into American popular music that it's fair to say almost everyone in this country was listening to. Yeah, I agree. So what we got, what, what do you have lined okay, up Okay, so this is, this is just a, a favorite Benny Goodman recording of mine. It's uh, by my favorite configuration of his, the classic lineup of the Benny Goodman Quartet. It's Benny on clarinet, Teddy Wilson on piano, Lionel Hampton on vibraphone, Gene Krupa on drums. Uh, integrated, multicultural, multi-ethnic quartet. I mean, if I had to be trapped on a desert island with one band, I'd want it to be the band that could build a boat. But barring that, this is the group I would want. And this is a very special recording. This is an arrangement they recorded of George Gershwin's The Man I Love. And they recorded it about a week after George Gershwin unexpectedly died. And with that in mind, 
uh, it gives the title and the song a, a whole different meaning. Uh, this, to me, is a goose pimple recording. I can't listen to this thinking about the, the passing of George Gershwin and, and not get a little bit of a, you know, a speck of dust in my eye. One of the many strengths of Betty Goodman is the fact that he always surrounded himself with the best talent, second to none. I mean, he had the best sidemen, the best arrangers, the best composers. And when you have a band like, you know, Gene Krupa, Lionel Hampton, and Teddy Wilson uh, backing you up, you gotta sound good. And uh, man, Lionel Hampton sounds fantastic on that. And if you caught, he does a little bit of a Rhapsody in Blue quote in the middle of his solo, yeah. and uh, you can kind of tell they're all thinking about the tragic loss of George Gershwin just days earlier. You know, uh, that made me think of Rhapsody in Blue uh, big time. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Sure. You know, if we, if we can, I'd love to highlight some of the lesser-known uh, clarinet stars of this era. Um, now, there is a, I, I will say there is a famous quote by Pee Wee Russell, one of my favorite clarinetists, where he said, there's plenty of money to be made playing jazz clarinet, problem is Benny Goodman has already made all of it mm -hmm. uh, but another one of the great unsung heroes of the clarinet is Buster Bailey an incredible uh, clarinetist he was an African-American clarinetist uh, he actually studied with the same classical teacher in Chicago that Benny Goodman did and he went on to play with Fletcher Henderson uh, John Kirby's group uh, the John Kirby sextet and then he was in Louis Armstrong's All-Stars for many years and he was just an astonishingly good clarinetist. And I've picked my favorite track by him. It's a tune that he wrote, appropriately enough entitled, Man with a Horn Goes Berserk. You know, I sometimes like to play this for my students on the first day, and I, I jokingly tell them that I want them to transcribe it and play it for me the next week. Sometimes they think I'm serious. Let's give it a shot. Welcome back to Jazz 101. Tonight our guest is Seth Keibel, and we're talking about and we're listening to songs that feature the clarinet. It's clarinet jazz tonight. We, are, we went through a couple of the artists so far, and uh, you have something lined up from Duke Ellington coming up. Well, yeah, I mean, Duke Ellington had some uh, wonderful clarinetist work with him, two in particular. Uh, for the first few decades of Duke's career, it was Barney Begard, a great New Orleans clarinetist, very much in the Sidney Bechet style. But then from 1943 to 1968, it was Jimmy Hamilton, also a phenomenal clarinetist, one of my favorites, but very different than Barney Begard. Jimmy Hamilton was really a, a classical clarinetist. I mean, you know, jazz history is full of incredible black musicians who might have gone into classical music had it been a realistic career option for them. Sure. Uh, and Jimmy Hamilton is a great example of that. Uh, so Duke Ellington, of course, was a master of capitalizing on the talents in his band. Uh, so he had this clarinetist with incredible classical chops, and he featured it wonderfully. So uh, the, the tune I've selected is a tune that was recorded by Duke Ellington. This is actually a live recording in 1947 called Air Conditioned Jungle. And it's basically a, a mini clarinet concerto designed to feature uh, Jimmy Hamilton's incredible clarinet play. Thank you. 
Just by being a fan of music, sometimes I always like, wow, I wish I was in the audience for something like amazing like that, you know? Oh, I, I've got a long time machine list of places and things I want to go hear and see uh, when I get a time machine. I mean, top on the list is going back in time 15 years buying stock in Google. Mm -hmm. But after that, there are so many different concerts and gigs I'd like to be a fly on the wall for. So Definitely. I, I agree with you on that. Now, um, so Duke... That was very. That was a, a long stretch. It was a great solo. What would do you feel that he wrote any of that or that, that piece or he's like this is what we're gonna do and just let it fly. Well, this one was was supposedly a collaborative piece between Jimmy Hamilton and Duke Ellington, but it's a great example of how Duke's music was often, as he liked to himself describe it, beyond category. You know, his repertoire is often classified as quote-unquote jazz because he is a jazz composer and a jazz musician and a jazz band played it. Uh, but Duke Ellington's oeuvre, I mean, really transcends uh, a whole slew of musical categories. And that piece is a great miniature example of that. I mean, there's a lot of classical influence in that in addition to a lot of modern influence. Duke Ellington was someone who uh, listened to the French Impressionist composers a great deal, people like Debussy, Ravel, Saint-Saëns, and, and I think that comes through in a piece like Air Conditioned Jungle. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah, I was saying uh, it sounds like the the uh, brown, black-brown beige period where he's really stretching his palette and he's kind of doing some jazz, he's doing... Uh, doing a lot of like classical longer pieces. Yep, extended works, uh, yeah. definitely. And uh, he's taking you know a casual listener into a, a journey, um, and uh, he's just not really totally focusing on on like say top forty hits, but uh, he's taking his his audience into a really kind of a a, a dream cycle. You know that to me that was a, a really a, a, a nice piece. Look, there's a, there's a reason why many people, including including myself might describe Duke Ellington as one of, if not the greatest American composer of all time. And I'm not talking just in the jazz milieu. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm saying in any category of music, beyond categories, he would say. I think uh, people out there who's not a real fan of uh, the clarinet would definitely know these songs because they are old uh, pop songs. Um, one of them is a, a Beatles track. Oh, yes, this is a, a beautiful rendition of one of my favorite Beatles songs, I'll Follow the Sun, uh, by Don Byron. And another great, incredible clarinetist who's out there making great music today. Uh, you know, he's someone who, again, 
uh, draws upon a myriad of genres. Uh, like myself, he actually has been a klezmer player. Uh, but then, of course, he, he's dabbled in gospel, in hip-hop, in R&B, in, in all different genres. Uh, this is from an album he did a few years ago called Romance with the Unseen, and it features Bill Frizzell on guitar, who's also one of my favorite musicians. <laughs> Um, but I said, let's play one more song for for um, our audience. Sure. And you picked out New Waltz. Can you explain what's going on with that song? Okay, so this is the, the closing track on this album, No Words. And this is an original waltz I wrote that probably draws more upon the Jewish klezmer tradition than jazz, although I think it's got a little bit of everything in there. And, and I have to, you know, do my shameless plug now. This song actually, much to my own surprise, uh, just received the grand prize in the Mid-Atlantic Song Contest, sponsored by the Songwriters Association of Washington. This is a big kind of a songwriting contest that uh, draws entries from all up and down the East Coast. And uh, I was shocked that this won the grand prize, because uh, first of all, it's very unusual for an instrumental uh, to take the top honors in this contest. Usually it's songs with lyrics. And not only does the song not have lyrics, but doesn't even have a good title. I mean, to be honest, New Waltz, was kind of a placeholder title that I was using. Uh, and I always figured that when I came up with a better title, I'd, I'd, I'd use that, and I never did. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was particularly pleased and surprised that this song won the contest, considering it not only has no lyrics, but has a rather unimaginative title. You didn't ask your son to pick out a title for you? No, I should have. <laughs> oh, and I should mention once again on this track, uh, you'll hear me on clarinet. Uh, the pianist is Sean Lane. Uh, on double bass, Bob Abbott. Uh, Wes Crawford is the drummer. All these cats are uh, local players who I work with all the time and uh, really great players. And they're the ones who make this music come to life.
Thank you, Seth Kybel, for joining me on Jazz 101. I'm your host, Tom Gowker. It is an honor to speak with you tonight. The producer of the show is Tyron Rice. Jazz 101 is recorded at WEAA-FM, Morgan State Radio, Baltimore, Maryland, the voice of the community and your source of cool jazz and more.